Okay, um, Nikita and Nebran, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, and Nebran, do you want to open your camera and say hi? Yes, great. Okay. Hey, everyone. Let's start our, the next session. The next session is brought by Nikita and Nebran. And the topic is state of Kubernetes. Nikita is the core Kubernetes contributor and she's the tech lead of the SIG, SIG contributor experience. And Nebron is a member of Code of Conduct Committee and they were going to introduce themselves and they will bring us the Kubernetes release, the new features and the key trends in this project. And everyone, let's give them a big welcome. Okay, then, and say hi to everyone. Okay, then we'll- Hey everyone, uh, yeah, just wanted to say hi to you all. Uh, it would have been so nice to meet everyone in person, but we couldn't be there due to some logistical issues. Uh, but hope to see you all at a future KubeCon, maybe KubeCon Detroit uh, that's happening in October or at some future KCD, but yeah. Nice to see you all there. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. Okay, then we'll start playing the videos. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to our session on state of Kubernetes in 2022, 1.24 and beyond. In this session, we are going to talk about what happened in the Kubernetes community in the last year what were the prominent themes or areas that the community worked on and the areas that community members can grow uh, in. What is what was released in Kubernetes 1.24 and what is going to be released in uh, Kubernetes 1.25. We will take a look at the major themes of Kubernetes 1.24 and the proposed Kubernetes 1.25 release. I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I am Nabarun. I work as a senior engineer at VMware. I have been contributing to the Kubernetes community for the last three years and currently wear uh, some hats in the community and maintain uh, a few areas of Kubernetes. Um, with that, I would let uh, Nikita take over. Hey, thanks Nabarun. Um, so hi everyone, I am Nikita. I also work with Nabarun in VMware on the Kubernetes upstream team. So we work on the Kubernetes open source project itself. Um, I've also been working on Kubernetes for the past few years now and also wear a lot of hats in the project. Uh, so I'm the TL first contributor experience and I was also on the steering committee in the past. <laughs> oh yeah, so Without wasting much time, let's dive into the Kubernetes project and see what's going on in, what has been going on in the last few years, last year, and also what's new, what's coming up, and what is also the latest in the next few releases. Uh, so we've had a bunch of achievements over the last year. So one thing that we've been focusing on has been feature maturity and stability. If you heard of this phrase that Kubernetes has been becoming boring, it is primarily due to this. So a lot of Kubernetes six or special interest groups are continuing to drive long-standing beta features to graduate to stable. Uh, you might've also seen some examples already. So IPv4, IPv6, dual stack uh, graduated to stable in 1.23, even generic ephemeral inline volumes also graduated to stable in 1.23. So you'll be used you might have already seen this kind of trend before, and you will see this trend going forward, even in 1.24, 1.25, and beyond. Uh, the other thing has been that we've been trying to grow our contributor base and have folks move up the contributor ladder. Now, the contributor ladder is basically the ladder or uh, the steps that you go through as you make progress in the Kubernetes project. For example, you start out with being a member of the Kubernetes project, so you get added to the GitHub organization. And then slowly, as you're contributing more and reviewing code, you, moved up, you get moved up to the reviewer uh, phase. 
and then finally an approval phase and then you finally lead a particular component or a sub project in a sick or a special interest group now uh, while many may think that contribute like climbing through this contributor ladder might only be related to skills it is not really so so climbing the contributor ladder is a trust building exercise as much as it is a skill one and how can you grow a, from a, like a process ladder by sticking around chopping wood and carrying water so doing the thankless work uh, like it could be as simple as writing more documentation answering more questions on slack and so on that is the main formula for growing leaders in the project and how you can grow up the contributor ladder now we've been taking intentional measures to have people move up this ladder so an example of an intentional contributor ladder growth effort happened in sick docs uh because they ended up growing their reviewer and contributor base in 2021 how did they do this they introduced a shadow program for pull request wrangling and they dedicated more time in the sick doc slack channel helping grow the community now sick docs not only this so like sick docs they've also worked on a leadership transition strategy to bring more community members into leadership roles via a specialized six month group mentorship program so kubernetes has a bunch of these mentorship programs and shadow programs that you can participate in to move up the ladder beat from member to reviewers or reviewers to leaders so they were able to cultivate leaders for the sake and some of its subgroups even adding new chairs and technical leads now uh kubernetes security has been a huge huge topic even in the last few kubecons and kcb is in across the world now every group in kubernetes has a responsibility to make sure that they're putting a best foot forward with supply chain security and there are three six that have been doing amazing work here so sig release uh sig auth and sig security in particular they worked hand in glove they worked together to drive sustained efforts in this area and what have they been doing so they've been doing everything from artifact signing uh compliance with slsv standards and improving end user security documentation so if you in like if you if the security documentation has helped you in some way or if you think you want to improve it please reach out to sig security and if what these three six to thank for for keeping kubernetes secure now there are also plenty of processes tools and policies that get added in a project life cycle and also that need to be phased out for whatever reason so one contributor pain point that we've had has been bazel and if you worked with it before you know how annoying it is to just get something running with bazel so the crews in sig testing and sig release they've put in a lot of time and attention on removing bazel from core kubernetes completely so it no longer exists in core kubernetes and uh, we've been trying to remove a lot of other processes and tools that basically no longer spark joy and finally sig windows so they've been doing amazing progress in growing windows support in the ecosystem with their efforts like defining operational readiness standards for windows now we saw some of the achievements that the kubernetes project has had over the last year Now, there are also some themes and trends that we are seeing in the community in the project with these achievements and what we've been doing, what we're planning to do in the future. So, one thing that you might have seen already is that there has been an increase in regression-related backports in the last few releases, and this has been happening due to a variety of reasons. But we've narrowed it down uh, to a couple of main cha- main changes. so one is that uh, there are a lot of areas in kubernetes that are just way too complex or way too under tested uh, and if someone creates a pull request to add features or fix unrelated bugs in these areas they sometimes end up creating regressions uh, there's also been well intended fixes or mechanical refactors but again like these areas are too complex or too under tested and then these refactors end up accidentally modifying some of the other behavior and end up causing a regression so to fix these problems we are doing two things so we are tracking health of the existing components understanding okay these areas are too complex these areas need more reviewers or more tests and we are also developing specific test plans for each component so we're prioritizing quality and ensuring uh, we're looking to ensure that we have a decrease or we basically don't have regression related backports in the next few releases uh we also trying to grow the independent contributor base by connecting folks to jobs so if you go to the cncf jobs website or cncf.jobs.io 
the job listing there also indicates a percentage of time that the employers would uh, support for upstream activities. For example, if I was posting a job posting on cncf.jobs.io, I would include in the job posting whether you, as an employer, are allowed to work, uh, say, 50% of your time upstream or 20% of your time upstream. So the remaining time you'd be working on the product related changes. So if you're interested in open source or if you want to contribute to upstream during your work hours and not put in uh, like your own personal time, this is an excellent way to get started. Uh, so I repeat like cncf.jobs.io is the CNCF jobs website where you can learn more about jobs that allow people to work on open source. Now, Kubernetes is very huge, and with its with it, its contributor documentation is also pretty big. Uh, and we are starting to take better measures to document more of these complex areas that I've been talking about and keep things up to date. But like I said, Kubernetes documentation is pretty huge, so we are also looking for a lot of help. So if you're looking to contribute to Kubernetes, writing docs is an excellent way to get started. So please consider contributing to documentation both end user and also contributor documentation. And finally, burnout. Uh, it has become an industry-wide problem now. I have faced burnout. I'm sure Nabaran can also like talk about him facing burnout, but we need to solve it together, right? There have been a lot of contributors who have left the project because of burnout too. And there are a mix of reasons why contributors are burning out altogether. Uh, to be very honest, we are still unsure of the exact solution to this problem. We know that this problem exists, but we don't know how to fix it completely. It is also a very complicated problem in itself. Uh, but what we are doing at least is we're constantly talking about it. So we're keeping the doors open for other contributors to have discussions with us. So if you are facing burnout, or if you think you might be facing burnout, or you're not sure if it is really burnout or something else, Please even consider reaching out to SIG leads or subproject leads, uh, the steering committee, and so on, just to talk things through. And we're more than happy to talk about it anytime. Now, let us also look at some of the growth areas that we have identified. Uh, so, what is the project doing to fix some of these problems that we've talked about now? Uh, so, one thing that we're trying to uh, the steering committee in particular is trying to do is define project health. So what does project health mean anyway, when you have some SIGs which have industry-wide uh, like open source veterans, and since they're veterans, they know how things work and they can quickly area, identify areas or components that need help or that need fixing. And they can even tell stories about what's flourishing. But Kubernetes is a very big project. It is a very diverse project, which means that people, different people have different experience levels. So we need to develop a standard way to establish universal indicators of project health. And this is something that is top of mind of the steering committee to understand or define what project health is. And once we define that, we can find solutions and ways to mitigate the problems too. Uh, the next thing has been reviewers. I can talk on and on about this. Uh, also, like if you've been watching open source news over the last year, supply chain security has made headlines. Uh, and according to even OpenSSF and other security groups, uh, code reviews are an important piece to putting prioritization on security. It is a very, very important factor and we cannot let it just go like that. So we need more reviewers. But like I've been saying that contributors have been facing burnout and they've also been leaving the project. Uh, so with all of this combined, we are looking to grow more reviewers in the project. Uh, and we're doing this through a lot of variety of ways, which I've already talked about, like the independent, growing the independent contributor base, look at cncf.jobs.io, things like that. But if you are interested, if you have the time, I would really recommend putting uh, a considerable amount of time in contributing to the project and actually growing up the ladder to grow from members to a reviewer, because that is what the project really needs right now. And also only a handful of the most active contributors will tell you that they work 80 to 100% of their time upstream. Uh, also a lot of senior folks in companies, they're just not able to get time to work on open source because they have a ton of other responsibilities. But the project is in dire need of senior engineers. We've had a lot of junior folks come in and contribute and that is great. Like I do not want to discourage that, but the project really does need senior engineers to step up and contribute. 
so we're working with the CNCF governing board to tackle long-term strategies to incentivize growth in this area. So the company should have uh, these big employers, they should have some sort of incentives so that they can ask the senior folks in their companies to work on open source. So we're working with the governing board for that. Okay, so that was a glimpse into the major trends of the Kubernetes project. Uh, now I'll hand it over to Nabaran to talk about what's going on in the Kubernetes 1.24 and 25 releases. Thank you, Nikita, for giving us an overview of the major themes that we pursued in last year in the Kubernetes community and what we achieved through them and also the areas that one can grow in and contribute to in the community. Now, I would like to mention some key features that were released a couple of months ago in Kubernetes 1.24. The first one, uh, actually, even before going to the first features, uh, if you look at the kind of features that Kubernetes 1.24 shipped, there is a healthy mix of net new alpha features, features we which graduated to beta and features which reached GA. There were 13 alpha features, 15 beta features and eight stable features. Two features were also deprecated. To talk about deprecations, um, after Docker shim was deprecated in Kubernetes 1.20, the component has been removed entirely from Kubelet in Kubernetes 1.24. So from Kubernetes 1.24 onwards, you will need to either use one of the other supported runtimes like uh, Containerd or Cryo, or use CRI Docker D if you are relying on Docker Engine as your container runtime. Next up, um, new beta APIs will not be enabled in clusters by default. Existing beta APIs and new versions of existing beta APIs will continue to be enabled by default, and that is the exception. Um, for example, if V1 beta one of some group is currently enabled by default and we create V1 beta two of the same group later on, it will still be enabled by default. But let's say, for example, we have V1 beta one of some other group which uh, is created newly um, in the future releases, they will not be enabled by default. So be sure to check in uh, the documentation when you are using a beta API uh, from Kubernetes 1.24 onwards. Kubelet now offers a Prometheus metric that registers the number of out of memory events that have occurred in a container. This will empower site reliability engineers in analyzing any outage and finding the root cause of a failure. What this will do is this will make users more happy as we can quickly debug any failures and make necessary amendments to the cluster. Next up, until now, Kubernetes created a service account secret by default when creating a pod. Uh, this token uh, or this secret contained the token which was used for accessing the API. Uh, from Kubernetes 1.25 onwards, the secret won't be created automatically. Um, going ahead, users are requested to use the token request API which has been stable since Kubernetes 1.21, uh, if they want to fetch tokens for accessing the API. Uh, the goal here is to increase security and reduce uh, the surface area of attack of the control plane. Next uh, feature is about uh, persistent volume health monitoring. Um, currently, there is no way to monitor persistent volumes after they're provisioned in Kubernetes. This makes it very hard to debug and detect root causes when something happens to the volumes. Um, with health monitoring, unhealthy volumes can be detected and fixed early, thereby resulting in uh, less chances of more serious problems to occur. Uh, while some of these problems may be corrected automatically by a Kubernetes controller, most of these problems may involve manual intervention or need to be fixed with specific applications knowledge. Um, either way, this feature is beneficial to monitor the health of EVs. Um, although we mentioned like five uh, most prominent features of Kubernetes 1.24, but almost uh, everything that we shipped in Kubernetes 1.24 changed uh, or improved the user experience of Kubernetes. So be sure to look at the release notes and understand uh, what changed in 1.24 if you are 
uh, planning to consume uh, Kubernetes 1.25. Moving ahead, uh, you might have noticed that Kubernetes 1.25 is right around the corner. Uh, it is going to be released uh, next month, almost in a, almost in less than a month on August 23rd. Uh, let us just have a look at what is proposed for this release. Um, currently, the Kubernetes release team is tracking uh, 27 alpha features, uh, 14 beta features, 14 features that would graduate to stable, and one deprecation. Uh, but do note, the release cycle is still underway, so these numbers will change until the release is cut on 23rd of August. Um, first among the features that you should look out for is multiple service CID, CIDRs. This will allow one to dynamically expand the number of IPs available for services. Currently, there are no limitations, uh, or currently there are limitations like users can't resize or increase the range of IPs assigned to services, which will eventually cause issues when the cluster runs out of available IPs, or you may get like conflict on CIDR ranges uh, when you're trying to allocate uh, IP addresses. The goal here is to implement a new allocation logic for service IPs, but the new implementation would be in such a way that it has to scale well, and it should also be backwards compatible with the current uh, logic. Uh, next up, liveness probes currently use uh, the termination grace period second set at top level on both normal shutdown and when probes fail. Uh, so what happens is if a long termination period is set by the user and a liveness probe fails, the workload will not be promptly restarted because it will still wait for the full termination period, which you uh, might have set to a really long duration. Um, what this feature enables is it adds a new field to the probes definition itself, which when set will override the uh, timeout set at the pod level um, for liveness and startup probes, but this will be ignored for readiness probes. Uh, the current behavior is still maintained if desired, but it also provides a new way of configuration to address the unintended behavior. Um, we also have a really cool change on the instrumentation side of things. Um, if you look at how you gather statistics about containers and pods, there are currently two main APIs, uh, the summary API and the metric C advisor endpoint. The kubelet currently is responsible for implementing the summary API and C advisor is responsible for fulfilling the metrics C advisor endpoint. Um, the CRI API currently doesn't provide enough metrics to fully supply all the fields for either endpoint. Uh, but is used to fill some of the fields of the summary API. What this results in is an unclear origin of metrics and duplication of work done by C advisor and CRI both. Uh, it may eventually lead to performance implications, which is not really what we want. Uh, this feature or enhancement aims to enhance this implementation of CRI to be able to fulfill all the stats needed for Kubernetes users. At a high level, there are two pieces to this, enhancing the CRI API with enough metrics to be to able to uh, supplement the pod and container fields in the summary API, and to enhance the CRI implementations to broadcast the request required metrics to fulfill this, uh, fulfill the fields in pod and container in the metrics advisor endpoint. Moving on to a security related feature that has been in contention for the past few releases, as you might have seen from uh, popular discussions around it, around the web. Um, so pod security policy admission plugin is finally going to be deprecated in 1.25 and consumers are requested to move to the pod security admission plugin, which has been there in the Kubernetes, in the previous Kubernetes releases and is ready to be used by consumers. The goal here was also to increase security and remove paradigms which may not be good for current practices. Uh, to the last, but not the least major feature coming in 1.25, uh, 
um crds need direct support for trivial non trivial validation um while admission web books do support crd validation they significantly complicate the development and operability of crds uh this feature proposes that an inline expression language be integrated directly into the crds which will which you will see as a subfield in crd crds so so that a much larger portion of the validation use cases that were earlier done using web books can be done without them and this feature is proposed to graduate to beta in one or two hi so when this gets released we will see that you users may not need to uh, contact uh, or when the, when the users create a custom resource uh, the performance implications of doing that would reduce uh, because now the api extensions api server could itself uh, validate uh, some crds uh, or schemas of those crds and with that uh, we reach the end of our presentation um thank you all for joining us uh, today on a saturday we would love to see you folks contribute to kubernetes um and obviously in case you need any help uh, please feel free to reach out to either of us on kubernetes slack uh, we would be happy to help you uh, in getting started Okay, thank you for Nikita and Nebron's sharing. Okay, let's go to the Q&A session. Is there anyone have questions want to ask? You can raise your hand. I think people might be shy, so I prepare one question. Let me ask first. Do you have any experience can share can share with us uh, when you joined the Kubernetes project first time how to quick pick up Navar do you want to take that I can um so I think the key here is consistency um to take some time off um and choose a topic which you really want to explore um one factor which has worked really well for me is finding uh the thing that i want to contribute to which i am using in day to day life um so that the motivation to contribute becomes very clear as in why am i contributing uh to the project and what am i getting out of the project in the longer term um that is a really important thing uh, to do when you start contributing and keeping at it is one thing because when you contribute something to the project you file a pr reviewers would review probably uh, because everyone is busy and reviewer bandwidth has always been an issue for the project uh, and the long term sustainability um, you just need to like keep on keep on at it uh, wait for the reviewers review and come back and uh, get your uh, things resolved um i think nikita has a framework that uh, she must speak about so i would hand it over to her uh yeah it's not a formal framework the idea that so i usually suggest others if you are if you want to contribute to kubernetes and you have your day job where you are not paid to work on open source i usually suggest a 4 hours framework uh, so 4 hours per week you spent on open source the way you to do this is uh, i think like one hour uh, you spend on attending the sig meeting so each special interest group owns a particular component or area in kubernetes for example sig cli owns kubectl so if you want to contribute to kubectl you would uh, look at the sig cli meetings uh, then 30 minutes you spend on just going through slack you don't have to talk if you're not comfortable actually writing on slack or even and the next 30 minutes also you just spend going through the mailing list again you don't have to the one thing that i think like a lot of people get scared about is hey if i attend a meeting do i actually have to talk in that meeting that is not true i was very scared when i joined the project uh, and i was feeling very shy and i was not comfortable speaking up at that time so i used to just attend those meetings you can look around um 
see what other people have to say, who is who, what they're working on and so on. So I would say one hour spend on meetings, 30 minutes you spend on just on Slack, another 30 minutes you spend on mailing lists, what are the main announcements and topics that people are talking about. Uh, and the rest two hours you spend on heads down time. So actually writing code or documentation or whatever it is that you're working on and reviewing uh, people's pull requests. So I usually sit as this four hour framework and it has worked out well for people. Uh, so they did start out in the project that way just by working four hours per week on open source and now they are leaders in the project. Uh, the other few things that I would also suggest is like, don't be scared starting out because initially when you join a Slack channel or a mailing list, you will see lots of messages, lots of people talk th talking about things that you have not heard about or you don't know how it works. Uh, but that is fine. So just stick around. There is a learning curve. So it will take you some time to get to a, a your comfortable contributor. Uh, but stick around uh, and take it easy and light and it'll be fine. Okay, thank you. And is there any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> they are so nice, right? Anyone? Uh, okay, there are questions, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to call out one other thing that uh, there is a KubeCon happening in Detroit, North America. Uh, in October, the diversity scholarship for that is open. So please consider applying to it if you want to attend in person. Uh, as for the diversity scholarship, Linux Foundation or the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, will pay for all your travel and accommodation. And you can get to attend KubeCon in person. Hopefully, we'll both be there, Chris, so it'd be nice to meet uh, you in person, too. Okay. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for your fascinating uh, sharing. Uh, I want to extend the questions uh, by the halls. Uh, there are two questions, and one for more professional one, and one for more casual ones. So for the professional questions, do you have any um, imaginations or, um, uh, yeah, I mean, imagination for the, our we Kubernetes users that we, we could um, cope with and we could make use of? Uh, your uh, blueprint for Kubernetes uh, development, uh, because we have I think we have uh, Kubernetes um, applications in our real production environments, and we have um, been benefited by this uh, fascinating and technology. I'm very thanks uh, to your uh, all you all for these contributions. But we still can feel that there are very, very much things we can do in uh, Kubernetes development. Do you have any suggestions that we Kubernetes users would like to um, you, uh, to uh, to follow up with your um, developments? This, this is for the professional questions. And for the casual ones, do you have any uh, other experience uh, to share us with when you join uh, the contribution of Kubernetes, do you have any stories that make you very, um, make you very, uh, how to say that? Imp uh, have very important impression and make you uh, very, uh, to stay, uh, to stay with this uh, Kubernetes contribution that, uh, heavy things or sad things or uh, obstacles, maybe. Uh, if you have these stories, I would like to, uh, I'm happy to uh, listen. Thank you. Um, so if I understood the first question, right, it is about, uh, what, so like, is, is it that, you, do you have suggestions in Kubernetes and how, like, how to make it easier? Or what are the things that we are working on right now in Kubernetes to make it better? Uh, I'll answer both of them. Uh, if, okay. Oh, okay. Um, you could share anything you want to uh, talk about, and I will prefer the last one so uh, we Kubernetes users could make the users better. But uh, I don't, uh, but you can say anything you would like to share. And I, 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 I'm free to your sharing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I mainly work on the API side of things, so the, what we call SIG API machinery. 
So I have uh, been working on how to make CRDs better and how to improve the versioning. So like there is no way to uh, mention a deprecated field in CRD. So that's another cap that we're working towards. So we're basically uh, working towards fixing a lot of uh, what we call paper cuts in Kubernetes, essentially uh, how to make the user experience better. So there might have been times when you got a really cryptic error message or just things wouldn't work the like, way you expected them to. And Kubernetes is a complex system, so we're trying to make it better that way. Uh, there are also some big ticket items that we are still in the discussion phase. For example, etcd, right? So uh, Kubernetes is tied to etcd right now, but what would happen if we move away from etcd. So we haven't started too many formal discussions yet, but there have been conversations in SIG API machinery around uh, what happens if we remove etcd, what other alternatives to etcd can we consider. Uh, for example, Red Hat, in not in the Kubernetes project, but in their own uh, KCP project, they started uh, experimenting. It's all open source. So they started experimenting with replacing etcd with CockroachDB. And then we've been discussing about, okay, do we really want to replace etcd with another opinionated approach of CockroachDB? And instead, can we make this pluggable uh, and like make sure that any other database can be used here? So these are just discussions that are going on that will eventually help make uh, Kubernetes more scalable and more uh, beneficial to the users. So that's kind of what we are mainly looking at. Um, Amara, do you want to add something here? I would like to add uh, things that we are doing in SIG release uh, in terms of security and making our software uh, pipelines more secure. Um, so in the past one year in the community, we have been implementing the Salsa framework. Uh, currently, we are at level two of Salsa framework, and we aim to be level three compliant by the end of the year. And as part of those processes, we introduced like signing of container images and binaries that we ship. Um, out to users so that they can have a clear provenance of how the software is built, what things were used, and to verify what they're using as part of their cluster lifecycle. Um, apart from that, a lot of the improvements has gone into stability in the past one year, uh, so as to make sure that customers who are using Kubernetes get a clear, concise, and uh, good code quality product. Um, and we have achieved a lot in those areas, and we have sorted out conformance testing for a lot of new features, and uh, the, the conformance subproject has been working for the past two years to introduce like more uh, feasible and streamlined ways uh, to do conformance testing, and we have increased the coverage by a lot uh, in the past year. So all of these things like make uh, Kubernetes to be more usable and more sustainable from a user point of view, both for... Uh, like vendors, vendors who ship Kubernetes as part of their product, or for end users who would like to use vanilla Kubernetes and uh, create clusters on their own. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, due to the time, we we cannot take more any more questions. But um, they already put their notes on the HackMD. So everyone, if you want to check the HackMD, you can see their notes. And also, if you have further questions, maybe you can write down on the HackMD or you just send, send them emails. Yes, thank you, thank you again. And yeah, thank you. It's our honor to have you in Coast Cup. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Feel free to reach out to us. On Slack and and yep. yeah. yeah, bye. On Slack. Bye. Okay. See you. Bye.